there's nothing better than a misty morning, but predicting when that's going to happen can be pretty difficult. Now, it is just a scientific process, so if you know what you're looking for and how it's formed, then it can help you out because it makes it a lot easier to predict when it's going to happen. In this video, I'm just going to give you a few tips that I've developed over the years and that normally work for me when I'm looking for this style of landscape picture. Now, mist or fog, they are technically different. Mist is when you can see over a kilometer, fog is when you can see under a kilometer, but let's be honest, most people use it interchangeably anyway. It can create some stunning images, but there are different types. And if you know what you're looking out for, that'll help you with the weather forecast. The, the, one, the main one for photographers quite often is radiation fog. Radiation fog is that lovely low-lying still mist that you get. It normally happens after a nice clear night when you've got some temperature movement. So in spring and autumn when there's quite big differences between the daytime temperatures and the nighttime temperatures. Radiation fog happens when the ground is warm and it releases that warmth via radiation into the nearby atmosphere, therefore cooling up the air around it. That then saturates and starts to form water droplets and you get this lovely still mist. Now, if the weather is a little bit more changeable, you can get something called advection fog. Advection fog forms under cloud on a breezier day and the reason for that is because it's when the breeze moves a warm air mass over cool ground. So you normally see advection fog over things like an iced pond or something like that. When you get this warm air move over a much cooler surface, that's when we start to see advection fog form. So again, you're not going to see this as much on a clear day. You actually have to have some wind moving through or a still day, I should say. Now, another big one for landscape photographers is mountain or valley fog. That's when you get these beautiful basins that look like they've just, a cloud has just fallen into them and got stuck. Basically, you get this dense air that gets stuck in a valley bowl and that allows this fog to just become trapped in that area. That's always very, very pretty. And normally it's to do with the landscape as much as it is any of the weather conditions. Lastly, we have evaporation fog. Now, evaporation fog is similar to radiation fog, but instead of things moving through a radiation warmth transfer, it happens because of warm, moist air evaporating into a colder environment, and then you get the water droplets forming like a condensation, really. If you think about when you're in a, a warm bathroom and you've got hot, steamy air and it hits your cold window, that's basically what we're talking about. Now, in the UK, we often see a lot of fog, again, in spring and autumn, quite often in winter as well, because sometimes we do have those lovely winter days where we've had cold nights and then strong sun coming through, and we get those beautiful, misty, foggy mornings to shoot. In order to keep an eye on the forecast and figure out when you're going to get those clear nights and those big temperature differences, depending on the type of fog that you're after, I use a few different apps and websites in order to figure out what I'm looking for. Now in the UK, our national weather service is the Met Office and they have an incredible way of finding out what weather we're going to get. They run loads and loads of models and then they pick out basically the ones that all agree. Now recently, in the last few years, the BBC split off from the Met Office and they have their own way of forecasting the weather. So I generally find if I compare the Met Office and the BBC and they agree, you're normally getting a good set of certainty of what the weather is going to be looking at. Now remember, if you're using an app, an app is normally a little bit out of date with the latest models that are being run. So apps are still very good, especially when you're using something like the Met Office or BBC because they're quite instant but they're sometimes going to be a little bit behind. So just bear that in mind. It's always good to check on the websites as well, because sometimes they can be a little bit more up to date, as well as, you know, live radar, because some of the live radar services you can find online now are actually pretty good. Another great way to get really up to date local forecasts is to use TAFs and METARs. Now, if you haven't heard of that before, you're not alone. I hadn't heard of this either until I took a drone course and we had to learn about TAFs and METARs as part of it. Now, these are the shortened weather bulletins, basically, that airports give. They're these very, um, very detailed 
um, shorthand weather forecasts and also live weather observations that you get at pretty much every airport. Now the great thing about the UK is we actually have tons of these little independent airports that also put out tafts of metars as well as big ones like Gatwick and Heathrow. They're not always as regular but it does mean if you are nearby to a smaller airfield you can find out really detailed local meteorological occurrences and normally they're actually really really accurate. Now they're pretty easy to learn, I literally looked at them for a day or two, found out what the different abbreviations meant and it comes second nature really really quickly if you practice a little bit. Now I personally use a website called windy.com, I found that really really good, I like their graphics and it's a very nice website just to look at weather on anyway. However, it is very easy to just click the airport button that brings up a lot of the airports in the country. You can just kind of zoom in, click on there, and it shows their live TAFs and METARs. Now, if you know your local airport, they'll often publish them on their website anyway, so you can find them out pretty easily, but I quite like being able to just check around a few different ones very easily on there and get the latest up-to-date local weather. Checking out the weather forecasting and science behind all of this is really, really important. That's gonna help you predict when this is gonna happen, but predicting exactly where it's gonna happen, your real best friend is familiarity. Figuring out your local area, going for walks early in the morning, taking a look at local maps so you can see where there's streams and ponds and things like that. You're always gonna get a little bit more fog and mist, especially some of the ones we've spoken about, because there are more types, but you know, I've focused in on some of the more sort of photographable types. You are gonna see them more around wetter or boggier areas, bits with ponds, maybe small streams. And the better you know your local area, the more things you'll be able to find. So I don't know about you, but when you walk for a lot in a local area, maybe over the space of a year, you see where floods or where it's very dry all the time or where it gets a bit boggy at certain times of year. And that may change where you're seeing that fog and mist. So going out for a few early morning walks, if you're not a morning person like me, I know it can be difficult, but we're in winter now, which is great because the early mornings are a little bit later. So you can get a little bit of a lay in before you have to get up on like summer. So go for some of those walks, have a look and see what's just being generated on a day-to-day -day basis so that when you are ready to shoot, you know exactly where to focus on. And one of the things that can help you plan your shots is knowing where the sun's gonna come from and exactly when. Realistically, the best time to photograph in fog and mist is just before sunrise in that sort of dawn hour when you get that beautiful low light. Sometimes you get those nice colors coming through. The moment the sun rises and just after it's risen when you get those lovely light rays moving through the fog. Now, to know exactly when that's going to be, the best thing to do is use something like suncalc.org. Now that just happens to be my favorite. There's a ton of these websites about, so you can see exactly what the sun is doing and when. You can select your location, you can select a date, and you'll find out exactly when dawn is, exactly when sunrise is, so you can plan your morning accordingly and it know exactly when you need to get to the location that you're going to, but also you can find out where the sun is rising. You can pinpoint it so you know where you need to be and you can completely plan your shot without even being there, which is so, so helpful. Lastly, although it's rare in the UK, I did just want to bring up freezing fog. We will normally get um, a very clear weather warning, if you like, about when freezing fog is going to occur because it's so rare. So if you're keeping an eye on the weather forecast generally, you'll hear if this is coming. But do keep a lookout for it because freezing fog, which leaves this frozen frost over everything that it touches, is just one of the most stunning things to shoot. And although we don't see it very often, do keep a lookout for it because it can create absolutely stunning landscapes and also macro images too. They're always beautiful. Now, if you want to ask some questions about this or please provide your own tips for how to find the best misty and foggy conditions, then make sure to pop them in the comments. I'll be so interested to see how you guys predict this because this is just something I've developed over the last few years. I'd love to know what you guys do to make sure you can make the most of those stunning mornings.
If you've got any questions, make sure to pop those in the comments too. I'll try my best to get back to with it. everybody as soon as I can. And make sure to subscribe to the channel. Press that little bell to turn on notifications because we're doing tons of stuff at the moment. Not only technique stuff, but we're also doing some challenge videos which are a bit of fun. And of course, loads and loads of reviews of new products all the time. So make sure to check that out. Now, it's a big thank you for me for joining me. I hope you come again soon for some more videos from Wex Photo Video. Thank mm -hmm. you.